I've got a mic in one hand and a clicker in the other. Um, I'm not sure how I might end up talking like this most of the night. Um, I'm not going to apologise for making a big closure. <laughs> But I thought I could warn you ahead of time that the little bit of code we are going to show is going to be closure-based code. So hopefully, at some point in your careers, even if it was way back in uh, high school, university, you looked at Scheme or some other kind of list variant. So the general notion of the kind of this notation of something like closure won't be won't be too scary to you. It's not super intrinsic that you'd be able to read and comprehend closure to be able to follow what they're talking about, but it will kind of be useful. All right. So, yeah, welcome. My name's Andy. It's John over there. Um, we both work at ThoughtWorks. Uh, ThoughtWorks is a global software development consultancy that works primarily on helping companies build and maintain digital businesses. Uh, we also do a reasonable amount of stuff in the architectural space, and one of those areas that we're uh, kind of closely associated through a couple of individuals in particular is the Microsoft movement. And that's what we're going to talk about. Microsoft. Microsoft. God, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you see, who's paying attention? This is the downside of talking to guilds before you get up. We're so talking about Microsoft and see. The microservices movement. Start with a joke. That's what I'm talking about. Um, now, monitoring in microservices is perhaps not the most interesting, stunningly wonderful way to kind of look at microservices. I'm not sure to what degree we're going to be able to change whatever perceptions you have about. The, the fine art of monitoring, but we'll see how we go. So this talk is very much inspired by, or based on the ideas from chapter eight of this book by my good colleague, or my colleague, who's also a good person, Sam Newman. Now if you've read this chapter, you'll be aware of some of the things that we're going to talk about. If you haven't read the chapter, that's okay, because we're going to kind of present the ideas as though you didn't really know anyway. But, but why should you care? Why is it important that you understand these sorts of things? Why is it important that uh, we have a particular, particularly unique take on monitoring in a microservices world, uh, as opposed to perhaps the way we have been doing it up until now. And I'm not, I'm not going to make that many assumptions about the way monitoring is done in general. But I'm going to paint, I'm going to try and paint a bit of a picture of extremes between the way monitoring can be done in a non-microservices based architecture versus the way you probably want to start thinking about doing it if you are going to go down this road. Because a lot of the organisations that are very much pushing a microservices way of building software have done the right thing and at the same time as listing all the benefits and all the positives with this way of building software, so the flexibility you get primarily, they've also spoken about the need that that, that flexibility doesn't come at zero cost. There is a need to build up operational maturity and operational capability in line with the complexity of the software you're going to be building. And one of those areas where you need to be operationally quite mature is around things like monitoring. So, why should you care? So, I, I've been doing web dev for a long, long while, and if I look, and if I kind of squint and stand at the right angle and look at the vast majority of the applications I've written over the last kind of 15 years, they all more or less kind of look something like this. So, there's a web server, there's an app server, there's some amount of data stores at the back end which I'm talking to, and there's one or more kind of legacy applications I'm talking to as well. There's going to be some variation around this. This is a very common pattern for the way that a lot of the, what we now probably refer to as monolithic web applications are actually built. And depending on the scale with which you're doing those things, you can actually go quite a long way with respect to how you monitor them using very, very simple tools if you want to. And indeed, this is probably my kind of first level support way of looking into problems on systems that I've built. I get onto the server and then I kind of tail the logs and see what's going on. Uh, see if there's any uh, stack traces, because they're easy to spot because there's like a hundred lines of them, uh, going on in the logs, what else is actually happening? So again, that will work up until a certain point, but it's surprisingly effective as a way of kind of working out what's going on and seeing what's happening as your application is actually running. You can, if you want to, kind of tail all the logs. You can tail your database and your app server and your web server, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Again, breaks at a certain scale, but surprisingly effective with very, very simple established tools up to a certain point. And there are indeed, if you want to go beyond that, lots of tools which kind of play in this space. And you'll be familiar with and potentially have used a bunch of these. So there's things like Nudgeos, which is probably the old grandfather of these sorts of tools. There's more modern ones like New Relic, more modern ones again like Splunk, I guess. Very few of these tools actually uh, purport or message to be monitoring tools. They're often called something far more fancy, which allows you to put kind of price tags on them with more zeros and the, 
on the right side. They call themselves um, uh, operational insights or business intelligence tools. But primarily, they're often used to be able to kind of monitor what's going on within your applications. Uh, hi, hi everyone. Um, so now that we've seen that, then what makes microservices different? What gives that a unique challenge that can't be solved with these kind of traditional tools? Um, so Andy's mentioned before, in a system like this, it's fairly straightforward to just tail some logs. You only have a few systems to deal with. Um, but of course, in microservices, and you may see this coming, you have something more like this. Um, so we have many different services, all talking to each other, some of them talking to the database. So how do you go about monitoring that? So obviously, tailing how many logs is probably not going to be a great option. Um, so we need some different tools in order to solve this problem. Uh, and also, there's other challenges as well. For instance, in a system like this, it's very easy to tell if it's up or down. If this thing in the middle is working, then you're fine. If it goes down, then your service is down. But if you look at this, so if this one piece here goes down, what does that mean for your application? Would you consider your application to be down, or maybe is there only one small function that this is serving? And so the majority of your application is fine, um, but just one small piece is down. So how do you determine sort of the upness or downness of your system? Also, just generally, the failure modes in a system like this are a lot more complicated because there's many, many different interactions. So this piece failing might have a lot of effects for a few other pieces, and the functionality that gets impacted is not necessarily as clear as we just have one big, one of the big service. So, just kind of what I've mentioned here. So all these things combined together result in a much more complicated, but not unsolvable problem. But it requires different solutions than what we've seen in the past some specialized techniques and tools to effectively monitor microservice architectures. So we're going to be talking about a few different techniques here. Uh, you can read them there. There's correlation IDs in their transactions and proactive monitoring. All right, now before we get to look at each of those in turn, uh, there's a little reference application that we're going to refer to. Probably why it's called a reference application quite regularly over the course of the night. And it's not overly complicated, but I did want to take a couple of minutes just to try and talk you through how this application works because that's going to help explain a little bit about uh, some of the concepts we'll be talking about later. So, this is a little work with that which implements a. Um, I was scolded by one of our security guys who called me up on my terminology. I did call it an encryption algorithm, but it's actually technically an encoding algorithm called CryptoSquare. And what you basically do is you kind of type in some plain text there, whatever that text may be that you want to encode, you click on the encryptionize button, and then you'll get something which is, a, again, wrong terminology, an encoded version of that plain text coming out the other end. That's all the application does. Okay? So there's no other use cases, no other functionality that it describes. It's just been built to encode a very simple algorithm and to be able to allow us to more practically demonstrate some of the concepts we want to talk about. Now the way it goes through that, the algorithm is pretty straightforward, is you take the plain text that's typed in, first step is you normalize it, you strip all white space, downcase everything and remove any punctuation. Okay, so that's a normalized version of that. The second step is you then split that normalized plain text into rows, okay, so in this case it goes from that to that. And the question you're probably asking is, how did I work out how wide these rows should be? So these are six character rows, so six, 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 then the leftover is going to the bottom one there. Basically, and this is where the name comes in, you work out the length of that plain text, so 29 characters in this case, and then you find the smallest square which is greater than that length. So 5 squared is 25, less than 29, 6 squared is 36, so 6 is the, the width of our rows here. And that kind of comes into the fact that we're building that plain text into something approximating the square. That's the second step. You then, instead of reading left to right, top to bottom, as you traditionally would, you read top to bottom, left to right. And you get into the point here where you're starting to build the encoded version of this. So you read down in the columns, and then you construct the plain text out of those columns, which gives us basically that. Okay. So there's about four primary steps there to be able to go from the plain text to the ciphertext. There's a little bit of I.O. There's getting the plain text in the first place, and there's displaying this type of text at the end. There's four main steps of the algorithm. Okay. Keep that in mind. So let's go to the code. Because what I've done, and at this point I feel fair to probably confess that I was away from school the day they taught bounded contexts. We're now covering domain-driven design. So please do not use this, especially as it was being filmed, please do not use this as a demonstration of how and where 
just quit a solution down into microservices. Um, what I've basically done is created more or less one service for each of those steps. So we've got a front end service which takes care of the input and the output. We've got an orchestrating back end service. Then we have three services here to be able to do the normalization, the working out how wide this, the columns, the rows are, the square, how the square is. And then we do a final one to be able to kind of piece together the columns into the ciphertext. Okay. So incredibly poor way of actually decomposing something in the services, but that was not the point. But if I can, I'm just going to take a little kind of jump to the side here and talk about one of the things which I'm sure has been covered in this group before, and indeed pretty much any community that's discussed microservices, which is what is a microservice? What is the definition of a microservice? I know it's been covered here because I went when I came to this group previously to see Charles talk, that was one of the questions that was brought up. And one of the first common examples, the first common answers to that question of what is a microservice are people trying to define it in terms of lines of code which, as probably most of us know now, so I think we've matured a bit since those original definitions came out, is a highly variable metric to use. So the example I want to give you is the square size of service, which is that much closure. Okay, so this is the thing which works out what is the smallest square which is greater than the size of our plain text. Because that's all it does. Um, counts the size of the text, which is the plain text calls a couple of Java functions, because Closure's quite good at that, to work out what that square size is. Effectively one line of code, when you kind of wrap that inside uh, a small ring-based Closure web app, it ends up getting about 83 lines of code in total. So I point this out just to let people know that if you're kind of thinking about a microservice as being something which is kind of a couple of hundred lines of code, or any number, whatever that number may be, um, You've got to be careful about the amount of overhead that you're adding when you're, once you turn something from what is a purely the business the value, the business logic you want to compute, into something which is independently deployable by the service. Back into the topic. Of course, now these introduced a sort of example system. I'll talk a bit about correlation IDs and what they are, what they're used for, and how they can how they operate in the system that we're showing. Um, so a correlation ID. Uh, is a unique identifier that basically gives you a way to trace a user's action throughout all the different microservices that it touches. So it's generated by the first service that the user calls, and then it has to be propagated through all the various <coughs> services consistently. Um, there's a few challenges as well to do with asynchronous calls and also calls to services that you don't control, which I'll cover a little bit later as well. So how does it look in our system? So at the first service the user touches would generate the code, so in our case that's the front end. Um, so that will generate the actual correlation ID for us, and then all the other services, all they need to do is propagate that ID through to each other. So how does that kind of look like? Um, so ID generation is very, very straightforward. So we just have uh, a string with a UID at the end, and also a prefix that can relate to the actual function that the user's doing to make it a little bit more readable to you. Um, but the main thing is this is guaranteed to be <coughs> unique for every transaction that a user does, and it allows you to trace that one transaction through all the backend services and see what it touches or what it doesn't touch, uh, and it gives you a lot of information. So you can see you have a constant here, and the suffix is a unique identifier. So there's a few different ways you can actually do this propagation. I have a list of here, so you can put it in a query string to get a nice big chunky URL that I'm sure everyone loves. Um, that's not always the best solution. It can interfere with caching and also give you a massive URL. Um, you can put it in the actual body of the request. Um, that can be a little bit fiddly because you don't necessarily want to mix it in with your domain stuff. So you don't want to have a body that contains mostly domain objects and then this correlation <coughs> that doesn't necessarily relate to anything that you're interested in. Um, or in our case, we're using the HTTP header. So we just chuck its custom header in here and that gets propagated through to all the services to allow us to trace where this request came from and where it's going. So now that we have a correlation ID, what can we do with it? Right, so I want to talk a little bit about a monitoring tool, for lack of a better term, called Riemann. Um, who's got Riemann experience, exposure, familiarity amongst us? Charles? One or two others? Okay. So, uh, look, I like, full disclosure here, I like Riemann because it's written in closure which to be perfectly honest is not probably the number one criteria you would use when picking a tool like this, but that's not here nor there. So, 
Rima describes itself as an event stream processing tool, which is a fairly generic name. In, in all practicality, it's used as a monitoring tool or as a, uh, a preprocessor for monitoring architectures, or where you have a bunch of things which are involved in your monitoring, and you want to do some stuff to the data that you're going to monitor before it actually gets it. Rima is very, very good at that. Uh, all the things on the left there are, from a Rima point of view, sources of information or sources of, of events. An event is a term that Riemann uses to describe one bit of data, one instance of one bit of data that you might want to monitor. So an event could be, and we'll see very soon, one HTTP response code returned from a web server. It could be um, one particular percentage CPU utilization from something that's monitoring CPU. It could be information from one log file coming out of one of your ad blocks. All of those things are individual events. And these are all typical things on the left here of places that would expose or um, or radiate the things in your in your applications. The things on the right here are systems you might use to actually take action or do alerting based on that information. You might want to be emailing people about something that's happened in your in your architecture and infrastructure. If it's particularly important, you might want to be using something like PagerDuty to wake someone up at three o'clock in the morning. You might have big um, visual dashboards in your in your team areas, because I'm sure they do it seek all over the place. Thank you, Gil. Um, you might use something like a Brado, sorry, Librado, which is a, a kind of monitoring tool as well. But all of these things here um, often need data, especially when it's coming from a whole bunch of heterogeneous sources, to be massaged, manipulated, aggregated. There's usually a bunch of business rules that you want to apply to this data before you necessarily send it to these destination systems out here. And Riemann plays very well in that particular space. Now what Riemann doesn't do very well, and the author will most happily acknowledge this, is do visualisation. Riemann does have a dashboard, which we are going to look at tonight, but it's not its raison d'etre. It's not built to be something like graphite. In fact, the dashboard is pretty shitty, to be perfectly honest, but it'll do for the sake of what we're going to show you tonight. In case you're interested, Riemann's written by a gentleman called Kyle Kingsbury. Kyle, I think he's made his name more for debunking NoSQL database vendors' claims that their systems actually provide um, um, parts of the CAT theorem when, when they have network problems. So he's spent a lot of time disproving, I think it's Cassandra and possibly Mongo as well, I'm not sure. Uh, but if you kind of Google Kyle, you'll read lots of stuff around that. Um, I mean, that's a side job or something, he also built this really cool tool for Remy. Okay. Now, at this point, let's take a little step to talk about primary architectural models for monitoring. So you have, on one side, a push model, which Redmond kind of fits into, where you have the place where you get your information from, so your microservices or your things which are monitoring your hardware or your disk, stuff like that, pushing information off to the system which is responsible for collecting that information. In this particular case, Redmond. Really. You also have the push model. Sorry, you also have the pull model, not surprisingly, which is where the collector and something like uh, Prometheus, so SoundCloud's Prometheus, if you're familiar with that, works in this model, where it will actually go and pull the sources or uh, something approximating the sources for the information to be monitored. And I think a lot of the tools that we looked at earlier on, the kind of Nardios and Splunks of the world, are going to fall into one of those two models as well. For microservices stuff, I have a bit of a bias towards push models for various reasons. So these are kind of like the criteria you probably look at for whether you want to go one way or the other. And for me, the discoverability more than anything else makes me think that the push model is probably better. If you're bringing services up and down, if you have elastic fleets of services that you need to expand and contract based on capacity, then having each of those services pre-baked to be able to send stuff to the collector is probably going to be a simpler solution than having the collector having to understand when those services are coming up and down. There are trade-offs. I mean, as you go through each of these criteria, the push versus pull models come out differently based on each of those. Um, but for me, the, I, I'm in favour of the push way of building these things. Okay. So, we were talking about correlation ideas before we started talking about Riemann. So each of our services running, in this particular case on my laptop, is going to be pushing data off to Riemann. And we spoke about Riemann events before as being one particular bit of data that you're interested in from a monitoring point of view. 
This is how Riemann describes an event internally. So this is closure code. This is a data structure in effect. It's a struct if you're from a C or C, C++ sort of world. Bunch of fields there. Um, there's a, a not atypical way of how you might want to populate those fields. So in this particular case, if you kind of read through the things on the left, you can probably work out this particular event is around a HTTP response code from an Apache server. We have information about the host, the service that's running on that host, um, some sort of state, the description, the metric itself. This is kind of the key one. This is the one that you're usually actually taking action on. It also has to be, or you're really one of the only ones that has to be really numeric. A bunch of tags, arbitrarily how you use those. Milliseconds since the epoch, and then the number of seconds until that event becomes null and void from Riemann's point of view. Because it's perfectly okay in a Riemann world to be able to um, have events expire if they're not dealt with quickly enough. Okay. Here's how you generate events from Riemann. So this is a lot of closure. This is more closure than technically I showed you on the first screen you needed to understand. Um, that's really the core bit of what you need to understand, which is just a function call. So, we're sending an event to Riemann. Um, we're not filling out all those fields in the event that we saw before. We're doing most of them though. This is coming from one of our, one of our services called SquareSizer. We're passing it as the metric field, the value returned from this particular function, which is, as the parameter to the function suggests, the elapsed time, the amount of time it took that service to actually um, perform. We're passing in the value for the state. That's also returned from a function call, and I'll explain why that's returned from a function call later on. And then for our description, coming back to where we started, we're passing the correlation ID. So we're passing that combination of the common prefix, crypto square, and then the constant of this particular user transaction, um, random UUID, as part, as part of one of the events, one of the fields to the event. Okay. John, demo time. Yes, so cool. So we have this awesome technique called correlation IDs and this kind of cool tool. So let's put them together in a demo that will hopefully work without a hitch. As the live demos always do. Of course, what could go wrong? Uh, okay. well, what's the first thing that go wrong is me not knowing how to switch to it. Okay. So we have uh, application here, uh, and we have the Riemann dashboard, which as Andy mentioned is not the core function of Riemann, so it may not be the most awesome looking dashboard that you've ever seen in your life, um, but it is functional. Uh, we have some things that we have prepared earlier here, but I'm going to try and send some requests through and see if you can spot the difference. It might not be easy, um, but I'll try one edge case that might hopefully stand out a little bit. So you can see here, there's a bunch of requests. Each one of these rows corresponds to one request that's come from the front end. Um, this is the correlation ID of the request, and each column here is actually one of our microservices. Uh, so you can see, I think this is the response time or something of that effect of each of the services. Uh, and also, the actual uh, code that generates these events has some randomness built into it, so um, every now and then it will fire off a warning, which is possibly a different colour. I can't actually tell that well because I'm colourblind, but so I'm told that there's something <laughs> there that happens. The down the <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> good, good. Um, so I'll fire off an event here and we'll see if we can notice any difference. It might be a bit hard to tell because there's already quite a few there. Um, but if I encryptionize something or not encryptionize, whatever the other thing is, uh, you see this dashboard has been updated. Um, so it's updating in kind of real time and giving us a new correlation ID, uh, which can tell us what services is actually being hit, uh, which is really useful. And if I put in an interesting case, or well, not particularly interesting, but a blank string, for example, I get nothing back. And if I look here, oh, look, there you go. So you can see, here's the request I just sent through. It's hit two of the services. Um, but it's actually short-circuited. Uh, so it hasn't needed to hit these in order to return a sensible response to the user because there was nothing to actually encrypt or encode, sorry. Um, so yeah, that, that's interesting. So you can see very clearly um, each of the different transactions is taking place from an actual user, and you can see what the response has been uh, from each of the backend services, which is really great to see at a glance. And so, for example, if one of the services failed, you can see a nice red, red box here and you could see exactly which transaction had failed and which service had caused the failure. So that's kind of cool. So that's all. So it's not all sunshine and roses. I did mention there were a few challenges when it comes to correlation IDs. And so in the case that we're dealing with here, it's fairly straightforward. All of the calls between the servers are synchronous. 
So we just send the correlation ID, well, the food server sends the correlation ID over to the bar service, and the bar service sends it back, so it's nice and straightforward. But where it can get a little more complicated, it'll be dealing with an asynchronous call. So we've all seen something like this before, probably. So the food service will call the bar service, get some kind of request ID back, and then at some point in the future, the bar, server, uh, the bar service will call us back and give us the request ID to correlate with this one. So the problem makes it a slightly, maybe on an order of magnitude more complicated, but still not unsolvable. So obviously here you need some kind of way of mapping this ID that it gives you back to your correlation ID, because a lot of the times, if this is on a service boundary, so you don't control this particular service, you have no way of knowing what ID is going to send you back, and you can't necessarily enforce that it will send you back the correlation ID you gave. Um, so you need to store just some kind of mapping to allow you, when you get this back, you can map it back to the correlation ID. So you do need to have some storage, and it makes it a bit more complicated, but not, not horrible, not the worst thing in the world. So now let's have a chat about synthetic transactions. So what are synthetic transactions? Uh, so a synthetic transaction is basically a functional test that you run against a production instance of your system to see if it's working. Um, that might sound a little bit scary, um, because it's functional tests and they're also running against the production system. And yes, they can be a bit challenging and scary, um, but with microservices, they give you a really good idea of whether or not the system is actually working and whether or not it's performing in the way you would expect and whether a user that uses your system is gonna be seeing the result that you want them to see. Because as we mentioned earlier, that can be a non-trivial exercise to determine if you're looking at the status of each individual service. So here's an example of a functional test that we're going to run for you today. Um, so this is like many functional tests you've probably seen. It operates at a user interface level. It's going to type in a little bit of plain text here. It's going to hit in code. And then it's going to <coughs> assert that what it gets back is what you expect to get back. And the code that actually runs this will run this test every five seconds. So every five seconds, it's going to run this, and you're going to get a result which will tell you, is my system actually working the way I intend it to work? regardless of the status of any of the backend services. So, so yeah, like I said, the synthetic transactions give us the confidence to know that our system is actually working in production in a way that can be difficult for monitoring the microservices themselves in isolation. It's not that easy to get that level of confidence. So one of the main challenges, obviously, with running this sort of thing in a production environment is how do you make sure that the metrics that you actually are getting from your production environment are real. So for example, if I'm a bank, say uh, an investment bank that deals with however many dollars, trillions of dollars a year or something, how do I know when I'm looking at my sales figures, for example, that these sales figures are actually real data, that they're not just fake data that I've injected? So that can be a really difficult problem that you need to be aware of. But in one example, um, it was actually that kind of a bank, and they, what they did was they put $10 buys and sells through the system every hour, and they were prepared to take that, that sort of hit because the level of confidence that these tests actually gave them, that their system was working, that was absolutely critical knowledge for them, and so they were willing to pay, to pay that price to get that level of confidence. So yeah, are these real? It's difficult to tell. Um, so another technique, which we mentioned earlier, is proactive monitoring. So, I'm going to be talking about proactive monitoring in the context of Hystrix, which you may have heard of. It's developed by Netflix and open source, which is pretty awesome. Um, don't freak out too much about this diagram. I'll be going through what it means with an example. Uh, but the basic idea behind uh, Hystrix is to give your system a level of anti-fragility so that if it does fail, it fails in a controlled way and it can actually recover. That's the core idea basically behind uh, this Hystrix stuff. And it uses a concept called circuit breakers. And this is a diagram of what a circuit breaker basically is, but don't freak out because I'll show you with an example, which is much easier to understand, hopefully. So here's our system. And in the context of our system, you can imagine a circuit breaker as something that sits in between the call to two different services. So initially, it will start off in a closed state, and that means any time the crypto square, square service calls the square, square size of service, the call is going to go through as normal, and everything's going to operate just nicely. But what happens if this service square sizer goes down? Well, initially, this isn't going to know that it's down until there's a request from the crypto express service down here. But once the request fails, and you can configure this in districts, so 
after a certain number of failures, this circuit break will go into an open state. And so again, open state, when the Crypto Square service tries to make a call here, it only gets this far. The call will never go and try and call this down service. So the way that works is that this circuit breaker is just going to call, it's going to return kind of a canned response. So it might be a 503 telling you that the backend service is down and don't bother trying. So this is good because if one of your services goes down and your users are getting timeouts, you don't want everyone to have to wait for 10 or 30 seconds or whatever your timeout is. So when the backend service is down, the first few people are going to get this timeout. But then after that, it's going to give you an indication straight away that there's a problem here. So eventually, after a certain amount of time that you set, it's going to go into this weird half open state, which sounds a bit funny. Um, but that basically means that when a user sends a request down here, it's going to try and go all the way through, kind of tentatively. And if that works, it'll go into a, a closed state again. But if this service is still down, it'll go open. So eventually, it'll go half open again, the service will go back up, and then it'll go closed, and everything's operating normally. So you get real control over when this service fails, what should happen, how should it respond, and also once it does go back up, it's business as usual again. There's no need to restart any services or anything. This will just close and everything will go back to normal. And it also gives you some questionably awesome looking dashboards maybe. Um, but basically the idea is you can see at a glance all the circuits in your system, have a look at the state, are they closed, are they open, and give you some nice metrics here like response times and that kind of thing. So it gives you a nice overview of the health of your system, which is kind of useful. Right, thanks John. So we've looked at three techniques or three kind of areas of techniques that um, seem to work well with the intersection of constraints or things which make microservices architectures a little bit more special than the ones we've dealt with before. So we had a look at correlation IDs, synthetic transactions, and look, like most of the stuff that we do in technology, these things are not new ideas either. Um, like I'm certainly aware of this correlation pattern coming from Gregor Hope's Pattern of Enterprise Application Architecture book, I think it was, Ed Enterprise Application Integration book from many, many years ago. Synthetic transactions, when I look at them, it reminds me of tracer bullets, which is one of the things that comes from the Pragmatic Programmers book as well. So these are a lot of very old ideas that have been reapplied to new ways of, of kind of building software. Um, the proactive monitoring one is the one that's kind of most interesting to me, I think, because it turns monitoring from being what's historically been a very passive or a very reactive activity to being something which is far more in line with this notion of anti-fragility, of being able to build systems which get stronger when they're under stress rather than get weaker and tend to be more brittle when they're under stress. So some final thoughts here. Um, if, you've come from, if you've done any re reading or thinking into uh, systems thinking, lean software development, lean enterprise, etc., etc., you'll probably be familiar with the term failure demand, which is talking about investing in solving problems, okay? investing in time, capability, people, in being able to react to pro things which are going to go wrong, under the assumption that things will go wrong. And look, that's, that's all well and good because I, I'm not hopelessly idealistic into thinking that there will be a day when there are never any issues with the software that we build. That would certainly never be the case with software that I personally build. But it's important to think about when you're investing all this time into things like monitoring and help desks and things like that, could you invest that money into stopping those issues occurring in the first place? What's, what's the payoff versus uh, building up a large amount of failure demand to be able to deal with issues when they happen versus trying to stop those problems happening in the first place? That's a bit, bit more of an existential one for you guys to think about. Um, Monitoring microservice environments can be quite tricky because they are more complex generally than the sort of pictures we saw earlier on in the slide deck today. You do need to invest in operational capabilities in line with that as per the people who have been kind of pushing this way of building software. There's no point going hell for leather in just splitting up your software into many, many microservices without making sure that your ability to take care of those when they're in production is at a similar level of maturity. By all means, Look at and certainly learn from leverage, steel, call it what you will, from organisations that have demonstrated an ability to be able to do this really well. Netflix being one of the organisations in particular because of the history of stuff that John was talking about, they've released a massive amount of their operation stack back into the public domain and there'd be very few people who I think could argue with their ability to be able to build and maintain fairly robust software at significant scale. 
Right, so that's all the things we had to talk about tonight. Um, John and I, well, I'm going to speak on behalf of John because I have the mic. <laughs> I have the mic to my mouth anyway. Um, I certainly appreciate the ability to come along here tonight and speak to you. Um, probably, I don't know, Saul, where are you? Uh, Do we have time for questions? Or? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yes. Any questions? Yes. So, with, with just to clarify, with the REAM and IA, you have to build logging into your, your microservices, is that right? It has, it has to, your microservice has to have code which calls into the REAM. With right. Riemann? Yeah. Um, yes, it does. So, so I was using, I was doing a call to a Riemann client then, but through, sorry, through a Riemann client to be able to send that event to Riemann. Yeah. So, so, so that, that is something you, you do need to be aware of. So do all your microservices have to be written in Clojure then? Oh, no, no. So it, there's, there's um, a binding for lots of different ways. Oh, okay. yeah. And the other thing is, I, mean, I think even when you compare the push, the Riemann push model versus a, more of a pull model like something like Prometheus, and I'm going to use Prometheus since I was playing with it today. Even in that case, I still needed to expose a metrics endpoint through my application for Riemann to be able to, sorry, for Prometheus to be able to scrape the data from me anyway. So there's still there's still a need in that model, or in certain versions of that model, to be able to build some of that knowledge about how you're going to get the data out into your application. Charles, and then back there. just a quick comment about the monitoring and production. Careful about CDNs and caches, otherwise you can get false indications or services up. Because the cache is going to reply to your query with the canned answer. That's all. Yeah. Did everyone, did everyone hear that? Okay. No one said no, so I'm going to show you this. Yes. Um, when it comes to separating the system into too many processes like services, and then we want to monitor those services and get feedback from each service to some kind of a system, you know, alert system to create the alert to the, like, management uh, stuff. Uh, there should be some places that we need to correlate multiple alerts to get a higher alert. So, but uh, I didn't see it, like, here. Can you explain about that? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to try and rephrase the question if I can. If you there are times where you might need to do monitoring at a level which is above the service, but is below the entire application. So aggregations of services, for example. Uh, yeah, well, that, that, that is certainly the case. I mean, that might that might mean that your services are too granular as well. It might mean you have done exactly what I did and break your services down to too small. Um, but there's probably, there's probably very good reasons why you might still want to do that even when your services are at the right level as well. You know, I didn't have anything at a significant scale to be able to show how that would be done. Uh, but I certainly think you can use correlation IDs to be able to do that too. Like we had basically a common suffix across all of our correlation IDs. You could certainly, and I know I've seen references of people that tend to um, introduce hierarchy into their correlation IDs. So if each new level that a call goes through, they'll add a new number or a new identifier to the correlation ID, so that you can actually track what part of the tree it's actually at. I haven't, I haven't done that myself. I'm, I haven't come across a need personally to do that in any of the work I've done. But smarter people than I have recommended it. So, who am I to say that's not a good idea? John. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think that concept of, of simply breakers. Is it something that physically sits in the middle of two microservices, or it's just a piece of, it's part of the calling service, or, or like more detail, how, how does it work? That, that yeah, sure, sure. So um, generally we'll be part of the calling service, so rather than calling out um, against a HTTP, like doing a HTTP.get or something directly, yeah. you'll wrap that in a class that's um, built by the Netflix guy. So um, you'll, you'll put a library, and then you'll wrap that call in this Histrix class, and you'll give it a run method, be an HTTP call and a fallback method, which will be what it needs to return, um, and then it'll just do all the rest for you. Yeah, I think just to add to that, so the Netflix guys are big fans of this idea of a smart client, so they do kind of failover and load balancing and the server breaking all within the client that's right. called the service. In the proactive model. Uh, we have two states, open and half open. What's the difference between the cost of calling? The cost of calling? Um, so in an open state um, and a half open state, the cost of calling is probably about the same because they're trying to do the same thing. 
Um, the only difference is in a half open state, there's no guarantee, or I suppose even in a closed state, there's no guarantee that the call will actually succeed. <coughs> um, but in a half open state, you know for a fact that the service was down, and so it's a reasonable expectation that it will fail again. So the actual cost of calling is kind of the same, they're doing the same kind of thing, um, it's just an indication of, yep, okay, I'm going to try again, but it did fail before, so I'm not sure if it's going to succeed. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I'm just not sure why we should. Because you know, when I'm calling uh, in the cloud environment or where the on microservices are I want to make sure that you know, there's a cost for every call. So if there is no difference between the cost for a closer state and a half of them, why we should do that? Why we should have two different states? I think Charles has something to say about it. It's the difference in the failure threshold. The half open state has a failure threshold of one. So if you get a single failure when you're half open, you go immediately to open. If it's enclosed, if you get a failure, you may not open the circuit breaker right away. It may take a certain number of failures before you open it. And the thing which is counterintuitive to me about the naming they use is that it's good for a circuit breaker to be closed, which makes perfect sense if you think about it from an actual electronic circuit point of view, but mentally I always keep having to split my natural thinking that closed is bad and open is good, whereas in this particular case, close is good and open is bad. Yeah, so is the ultimate goal for a circuit break to protect the resource or from controlling it out and helping it sort of like gain its um, ability to service requests in the end? Is that what the ultimate goal of the circuit break is? Um, good question. I think that's probably part of it. Uh, and also, if the service is not responding like as you want, it gives you a chance to kind of like do a recovery on the service without having an unknown impact on all the services that depend on it. Um, so you can define exactly how it's going to fail if it fails, so it's not unpredictable behaviour. So if something goes wrong with that service, you can safely, for instance, restart it and know exactly what's going to happen, and it gives you that level of predictability. And Charles, the, the other reason is that a lot of times when a service is down, you get retries. And so you're going to have 10 people retrying on this poor service, which can, in fact, cause it to stay down. And so this is a way of letting the service come back up. Keeping the thundering the other way. <laughs> Still, with the breaker sitting in the calling service, you will have three or four services calling at a service that is down. Uh, each one of them will have the retries, right? Because, because the circuit breaker is in on each of the calling services. Correct. So, so all right. That, that, that's... Um, So the question was, if you're living in a world where um, you don't have microservices and your infrastructure is not set up to deal with them, and um, what's the cost of kind of bringing this all up to speed so that you do have the capability to split stuff into microservices? Is that the gist of it? Yep, okay, good question. Um, it's hard to answer without knowing kind of the details, I guess. It's going to depend on, I guess, how big your system is. Um, but generally speaking, the cost that incurred in sort of setting up all the monitoring and stuff required to support microservices um, can be worth it. Um, so it just depends on, I guess, where you want to go. It's hard to give a concrete answer, um, but if microservices is a place that you really want to get to, then you just have to be aware that you're going to need to pay that cost. And how, how expensive that is really does depend on your organization. And did you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it's, yes, there's monitoring cost, that's right. There's cost around the monitoring maturity as well, but there's going to be other areas you're probably going to need to spend as well. Um, so, it, so probably testing, probably deployment, uh, probably alerting if you consider alerting to separate from monitoring, probably log management. There's probably lots of operational areas that are going to need a bit of an uplift in, in, in line with the microservice and stuff. Um, in terms of hard and fast costs, who's, it's got to be someone from REA here. REA folk? Hello. Okay, I think. <laughs> Next speaker. Um, so I, I remember speaking to people at REA, I, 
couple of years ago. So they've invested very heavily into this. And the cost that they were associated with this was a massive part of their overall IT budget. I, won't, I can't talk about exact numbers, but significant, 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 lots of zeros, types of dollars. Um, but again, if you're, if you're only building two or three microservices, it's probably nowhere near that. Um, but if you're kind of talking into the 10s and the 20s and the 30s, uh, and you want to be doing continuous deployment or continuous delivery, then there's going to be a lot of that stuff you need to look at. But it, it is a diminishing cost over time. You know, once you get patterns in place and start sharing ideas around that cost will, first of all, it'll pay, it'll reduce over time your upfront cost per service and you get the return of the flexibility. Yeah, yeah I, certainly I, I don't think, I think the ROI for microservices is probably far longer than the equivalent amount of functionality you get out of a monolithic application. Far longer. I think mean, the upside's greater. I think the ROI is going to come far later in the last minute. We've got time for one more. One yep. more Do you send all your data through to a single uh, agreement instance or one per availability zone? What does it look like? So one of the great ironies of Riemann is it, uh, especially given the guy who wrote it, is that it's not made to be working in distributed fashion. <laughs> um, you can forward stuff from one Riemann server to another, but um, I'm not even sure if that functionality is necessarily part of the kind of prescribed operating model for it just yet. So all the experiences I've had is a bit going through to one remit. And again, um, you, there's, there's performance considerations you need to take into consideration. If you're taking too long to consume events off of Riemann's queue, if too many events back up in the queue behind that, with the time to live settings you set put on your events, you might lose some of that bit of data. But Riemann's, and Kyle is very unapologetic about the fact that Riemann does not guarantee it's going to consume every single event that you have. Um, the data that you should be getting through it, you should be able, you should be okay to lose some percentage of that information and still be able to get enough data flowing through to be able to make reasonable business decisions. If you're collecting data with great frequency, if you miss every 20th data point, it probably doesn't matter. You're probably looking for spikes over a prolonged period of time, like over uh, 20 seconds rather than off over 0.5 of a second. Um, but yeah, sing single ribbon instance has been the way I've looked at it. It's been clocked to be able to handle, depending on how he heavyweight your processing is, I think it's 20,000 events per core, um, per, per 20,000 events per millisecond per core, I think. But again, that's probably a fairly trivial amount of processing that's been done. You can actually put it, because again, Riemann's configured completely in Clojure, because it's written completely in Clojure. Anything you could write in Clojure, um, you can use to construct a business rule for how Riemann does stuff. We were doing very simple visualizations there, but it has lots of building functions to be able to do um, more advanced statistical um, analysis of data coming in, so kind of sliding time windows, percentiles, all that sort of stuff. You can go to town with the amount of logic you put into Riemann, but if that means that Riemann's taking longer to consume events, then there's a potential for more events to be backing up behind it. So there's a bit of a trade-off there as well. Okay. All right. Thanks, Andy. Thank you.